July 7th, 1996. Good Lord. It was 23 years ago. I had a little bit more hair on the top of my head, but still living at 38 now, a lot more on top of my head than a lot of you and a lot less on my chest and my back. Believe me. And a little more weight on the old schleg belly, but still, same rules apply. 23 years ago, Bash at the Beach 1996 happened. What's so notable and significant about that show, that date, that event, that of course is when Hulk Hogan betrayed WCW and aligned himself with the Outsiders, Scott Hall and Kevin Nash, and it marked the formation of the NWO, the New World Order, or as Hogan tripped up a couple times during his promo, the New World Organization, brother. Golly, 23 years ago. Man, time flies. Like, I had just finished my freshman year of high school. Bill Clinton was running for re-election as president of the United States. The Bulls had just won the NBA championship in six games over the Seattle Sonics. The Yankees would go on later that year to win their first World Series of a four titles in five year stretch. Good Christ almighty. That was a long, long time ago. But still to this day, that show, that event, and in particular that moment resonates with so many people. And I truly wonder, truly, truly wonder if we will ever, ever see anything like it in professional wrestling ever again. Like, ever again. And for those that are younger and those that might not have the appreciation of who Hogan was in the 80s and what he was representing here in the 90s and what all played out, the best comparison I could give you is this. Is let's say All Elite Wrestling was around for a few years. Or you know, let's, let's take All Elite Wrestling out of it. Let's say about seven, eight years ago or so. Let's just say, humor me here for a second. That you had Randy Orton and Batista jump ship from WWE to TNA. And John Cena was already there in TNA. And Batista and Randy Orton are destroying things and they're ruining shows and they're fucking with the roster and all of this. And then you get to this big payoff match, let's say at a Slammiversary. And it's like Samoa Joe and AJ Styles are taking on these two guys in Randy Orton and Batista. And maybe there's a third guy involved. You throw Christopher Daniels in there. What the F? Why not? And then all of a sudden, out comes John Cena, who for so many years had represented so many things about professional wrestling. Now, humor me here for a second. Just hypothetical scenarios. But Cena was that kind of vanilla, white bread, baby face type of guy, would never do anything bad, even though a lot of things that he did were very heelish, similar to if you look back at Hogan during his time in the 80s and early 90s in WWF. There were some heelish things. I'm going to get mad at you, Sid, because you eliminated me in an every man for himself Royal Rumble. You know what I'm saying? But John Cena comes out, and you think he's going to save Samoa Joe and AJ Styles and Christopher Daniels, and instead, he sits there and does a famous or some other type of John Cena bullshit and AA and FU, whatever the hell you want to call it, to AJ Styles. And he aligns with Randy Orton, and he aligns with Batista, and they become the breakfast club of TNA. Now think about what that would have meant on a smaller scale to wrestling back about nine, ten years ago. 
And it still wouldn't even come close to measuring up to all the story and history involving Hogan being the ultimate hero, the ultimate good guy, and having Hall and Nash come from the great white organization up north, brother, and coming down to Tad Turner's wrestling company. Like, that's the closest thing I could give you as a comparison, and it doesn't measure up anywhere close. If you think about it back in that time, that would have probably done record business for TNA if you were able to pull that off, especially because TNA would have been able to be in a position with John Cena where they had not put a decade of marketing behind him as being that top babyface. They could do things differently with him. They could take risks. They could sit there and gamble and roll the dice like WCW could with Hogan, especially because that run from 94 up till before Bash of the Beach 96, it wasn't all that great for Hogan. He was getting booze. They were doing a lot of stupid things creatively. Yaka pie! And all this other crap. But my God, at Bash at the Beach 1996, it all came together. And I, I was watching it today because as I'm recording, this was the 23rd anniversary of Bash at, Bash at the Beach 96. And to see the emotions that could be invoked from the fans as Hogan turned his back on everything he had represented all of these years... And he said, screw the fans, I'm doing it for the money. My God, it could have only worked with Hogan to the level that it did. You could have put Sting in that spot, and you might have made it work. But in the grand scheme of things, let's be honest, it would have just been another wrestling faction. But with Hogan as that dude, as Hogan as the man that stirred the drink that made everything go, for so many hardcore, like, more serious wrestling fans that had grown to hate and resent so many things about Hogan all these years. You gave the fans what they wanted. They wanted to hate Hogan in Ted Turner's wrestling company because they still associated him with Vince. So now you got Vince's corporate guy coming down to the Southern company and being a corporate type of fucking champ. Like, it was perfect. It was magnificent. And for those all these years later that talk about Bobby the Brain Heenan spoiling it, saying whose side is he on as Hogan's coming down the ramp, if anything, it was character consistency with Heenan saying that because Heenan for years always talked about how Hogan was really a bad guy. He for years would talk about the evils of Hulk Hogan. So it made sense at that particular moment, even though in the grand scheme of things you look back and it sounds like, hey, that could have potentially spoiled it and ruined it. It was actual character consistency from Heenan that he would say something like that. And besides, you had Shabani and you had fucking the American Bleem Dusty Rose out there to sell the good. Go get him, baby! You had the career of a lifetime and you flushed it down the toilet. <laughs> Hulk Hogan, you can go straight to hell! Ah, damn it. Like watching that again today, 23 years later. Like, so many things align so perfectly to have Hall and Nash come in and present them in the way that you did. And then when you get to this big seminal moment in history, July 7th, 1996, to have the right guy in the right moment at the right place in the right time to pull it off. As the culture of the mid-90s was starting to change and there were, were elements of Crash TV with Jerry Springer and so forth that were being coming much more mainstream. Now you had the NWO was going to help really sh shepherd that in to the professional wrestling landscape. And here you had Hogan, you had Hall, and you had Nash at a time in the mid-90s where rap and hip-hop culture were very prevalent in mainstream American culture for black kids and white alike. Here was a group of guys that everybody thought were fucking cool sitting there basically using gang tactics. That's exactly what it was. Like everybody could relate or aspire to it at that time and all the crazy stuff that they were able to do with these guys. But it all started right here at Bash at the Beach 96. And I was watching it today and sitting there and seeing all the fans throw the crap into the ring. And you would never have that now because the wrestlers and fans would get all emotional about it. You don't throw anything at him. It's about respecting it's about it. No, motherfuckers. It is about making money. And when you have the ability to move the fans to such a degree where they are legitimately pissed, not just bored or irritated and throwing shit, but they are literally throwing shit at you because they hate you 
and they hate this, and you have pissed them the hell off to their core, that's when you got them. And that's not to minimize the risk here for Hogan. All of those years of being a top babyface, all of those years of making all of those millions of dollars, if that heel turn did not work, if that moment did not work, it could have ruined everything. It could have taken him from being the biggest star in the history of wrestling to just being another dude hanging on well too long. And instead, what it served as was a way for Hulk Hogan to extend his career at the top, to revitalize his career and reshape and mold and reimagine his career trajectory to a level that before that you would have never envisioned truly being possible. And I look at wrestling now, and it's moments like these that I wish I could see. But the reality is, we won't get them. Like, even if you remember back TNA in 2010 at Bound for Glory, 10, 10, 10, they're coming, they're coming, they're coming. But, you know, so many people are thinking it's going to be this guy or it's going to be that guy. And it's Jeff Hardy that aligns himself with Hogan and Bischoff and crew. And the fans were pissed and they were throwing shit in the ring and everything else. And it's like, ooh, you really got something here. And then we know what happened after that. You think about the summer of 2011 and you have this element of CM Punk is leaving the company bullshit. But you know what I mean. But he could win the championship and then take the belt. And instead of doing what you would do when you're actually trying to tell a good story, instead of sitting there and trying to truly shake stuff up and do something different, and create a megastar out of somebody and in the process create a new identity for your brand, CM Punk wins the belt of Money in the Bank 2011 and he's back fucking eight days later on Raw. And the whole thing was <laughs> ruined. And it just really matches our culture now of that instant gratification, that lack of patience, almost that sense of entitlement of, I want it and I want it now. You could never have a Hogan-like turn ever again in professional wrestling. I don't blame wrestling companies, and I don't even blame the wrestlers. It is just a, a reflection of our current society. Because never could you have a guy like Hogan be packaged like Hogan, who worked like Hogan, who acted like Hogan, be a top babyface for over a decade without the fans routinely turning against him to larger and larger degrees. So that way then, when you would get to this moment, if you put a John Cena in that situation and say, he spent 10 plus years at the top of WWE being forced down everybody's fucking throats. Let's say he did go to All Elite Wrestling and he had now Randy Orton and Sheamus there fucking waiting for him. You tried this shit with Cena, he'd get fucking cheered because it'd be like, finally, the asshole's listening because he's not in Vince's organization anymore. And the whole concept goes to crap. But when you think about that moment, this is one of those reminders that times change. And sometimes times change for the better. And sometimes they don't. And there's not any one person to blame, but we are never going to see a heel turn like that ever again. I don't know if we'll ever see a moment like that in professional wrestling because at that moment in time is when things changed in wrestling. WCW started kicking WWF's ass in the ratings war. It was that which eventually led to Vince saying, you know what, fuck it, I'm out of touch. You guys help me out and let's start the fucking Attitude Era. And that's where you get Stone Cold Steve Austin and the goddamn Rock. And you get that fight, fucking goth late 90s taker to counteract what you were seeing with the NWO and fucking goth crow sting and all DDP and all this other awesome shit that WCW had. Like if anything, it's a reminder of the great talent and the great characters and the great storytelling and the great kind of can you top this type of mentality that was in wrestling at that time that we just don't have now. And as much as we hope for it, and as much as we fiend for it, it is never, never, never going to come back to that ever again. So it is one of those things, unfortunately, that you can focus on it and think about the way things used to be and let the nostalgia get carried away with it and be like, it's never going to be like that again. Because it's not. It's just not. Or you can sit there and say, you know what? Maybe the future can be good in its own ways, even though I have my significant doubts, which I do. And I just choose to look back at a special moment like that and wish that somehow, some way, 
I can experience it now in professional wrestling even just one more time. If you want to understand why so many old fans love WCW, go watch Batch of the Beach 1996 for your answer.